Hello, noble friends. Welcome to Premier Ta Philosophy. I'm Dr. Peter Yong, and today I'd like to examine the Heideggerian account of dwelling and use it to explain the domicile assignments of the Thema Mundi. The twelve signs of the zodiac are fundamental to Western astrology. Each sign is identified with a 30-degree segment of the ecliptic, the sun's apparent path through the fixed stars, and is said to signify various states of affairs. A sign is, as St. Augustine observes, a thing which, over and above the impression it makes on the senses, causes something else to come to mind as a consequence. I might, for example, stumble upon an imprint on a mountain trail and take it as a sign that a bear is nearby, perceive smoke in the distant hills and take it as a sign that people are camping there, or hear the word Plato and call to mind the famous philosopher. In these cases, I am not concerned with the immediate sensible properties of my experience, the feel of the dirt in which the paw print is impressed, the billowing shape or color of the smoke, or the particular tones composing the word Plato, but with what these sensible properties signify. Zodiacal signs are signs in this sense, and were understood to be so in the ancient world. Varro, for example, observes that, quote, Signa signs of the zodiac means the same thing as sidera, constellations. Signa are so called because they significant, indicate something, as the balance marks the equinox." End quote. A general consensus eventually emerged in which zodiacal signs were thought to signify on account of their gender, masculine or feminine, quadruplicity, tropical, solid, or double-bodied, and triplicity, fire, air, water, or earth. I'd like to here examine an even more fundamental account of zodiacal signification, dwelling. I contend that it is through dwelling that assigns gender, quadruplicity, and triplicity manifest their particular characters, and allow a sign to signify. Zodiacal signs were called houses in traditional astrology. Specifically, signs were identified with the houses of particular planets. For example, Valens begins his description of the nature of the zodiacal signs as follows, quote, Aries is the house of Mars, a masculine sign, tropic, terrestrial, governing, fiery, free, upward-trending, semi-vocal, noble, changeable, procutorial, public, civic, with few offspring, servile, the mid-heaven of the universe and the cause of rank, two-toned since the sun and the moon make white lichen." End quote. He gives similar accounts of the other signs, noting, for instance, that Gemini is the house of Mercury, Cancer the house of the moon, and Leo the house of the sun. The canonical assignment of planets to houses came to be known as the Thema Mundi a representation of the planetary abodes at the creation of the cosmos. Macrobius describes it as follows, quote, Offer the reason that these twelve signs are assigned to the influence of different divinities. They say that when the world was being born, at the very hour of birth, Aries occupied the middle of the sky, and the moon was in Cancer. The sun then rose in Leo, Mercury in Virgo, Venus in Libra, Mars in Scorpio, Jupiter in Sagittarius, and Saturn in Capricorn. Thus it came about that each of the planets was considered lord of the sign in which it was believed to have been when the world was born. The ancients assigned only one sign to the sun and one to the moon, those in which they were at the beginning, Cancer to the moon and Leo to the sun, but to the other five planets, five more signs were allotted in addition to those in which they were stationed at the beginning, the second apportionment being resumed where the first left off. The last planet mentioned above was Saturn and Capricorn. In the second apportionment, the order was reversed, and thus Aquarius, following Capricorn, was allotted to Saturn, Pisces to Jupiter, Aries to Mars, Taurus to Venus, and Gemini to Mercury." End quote. 
So, according to Macrobius, the sign of Leo is given to the Sun as its home, and the sign of Cancer to the Moon. The other planets are then each given two homes. Mercury dwells in Virgo and Gemini, Venus in Libra and Taurus, Mars in Scorpio and Aries, Jupiter in Sagittarius and Pisces, and Saturn in Capricorn and Aquarius. Ancient astrologers took this primordial assignment of planetary residence to be crucial to understanding both planets and signs. For example, Firmicus Maternus claims that Petasiris and Nechepsko, two key sources for Hellenistic astrology, wish to prove that the fates of men are arranged in accordance with this birth chart, the conditions of the planets, and the influence they exert on the chart. But it is not entirely clear what such claims are supposed to amount to. Though the Thema Mundi is offered as an example for astrologers to follow in the charts of men, the underlying rationale for this original assignment is absent. There is clearly some kind of relation between planet and sign that makes the latter a fitting home for the former, but we are left to speculate about the nature of this relation. What grounds it, and why are these particular planets given to these particular signs and not to others? Chris Brennan suspects that this assignment must somehow be grounded in a natural consonance between planets and their corresponding signs. He observes, quote, From a practical standpoint, it seems that a planet's domicile is a place that the planet enjoys being in because it is most well suited to its own natural expression. In other words, when a planet is at home, it can do what it wants. And what it wants to do is signify the things that come naturally to it. End quote. Planets enjoy residing in particular signs because something about those signs allows them to signify what comes naturally to them. This intuition seems correct, but we need to further inquire into what this natural consonance consists in. What does it mean for planets to naturally want to signify some things rather than others? And what is it about their domiciles that allows them to do so more easily? Demetra George attempts to answer such questions by drawing an analogy to feudal estates and their natural resources. Like feudal lords, planets have particular objectives they want to achieve. And, like feudal estates, signs have a variety of natural resources to be used in furthering these objectives. She observes, quote, it is useful to imagine each zodiacal sign as a different estate or feudal manor that has its own particular natural resources. A planet might dwell in one of its own estates in which it has access to a certain kind of power or resource. However, some resources are better suited for some planets than for others. This is the reasoning for why planets can be more effective on some zodiacal signs than others." End quote. So, on this view, Mercury, a planet that wants to communicate, is given to Gemini because it is equipped with a state-of-the-art business center and drone courier service. The Gemini estate has the resources Mercury needs to carry out its planetary will. And given that different estates have different natural resources, Mercury might have a more difficult time living in different signs. Quote, for instance, should Mercury find himself on the Taurus estate, no matter how beautiful the pastoral setting and delicious the organically grown food, the residence is out of range for phone and internet reception." End quote. While this metaphor may be useful in making delineations, it does not adequately explain the natural consonance between planets and their dwellings. For there are several problems with this natural resources model for domicile rulership. First, it is not found in our source texts. Though signs are called houses, and planets can be referred to as house rulers, Hellenistic astrologers made no explicit attempt to explain the relation between these concepts by appealing to the natural resources contained in signs. Second, this account does not explain what it is for a sign to have natural resources. The claim cannot be understood literally. The sign of Gemini has no physical business center, and one will find no food, organically grown or otherwise, in Taurus. The metaphor thus needs to be explained, and so, by itself, is an insufficient rationale for domicile assignment. 
And finally, and most importantly, I believe that understanding the relation between planets and their signs in terms of will and natural resources anachronistically reads our contemporary exploitative approach to nature, what Heidegger called in framing, back into classical astrology. While we might approach our environment through the will to power, seeking to set upon it to yield maximum gain at minimum costs, I do not believe that we should presume that ancient astrologers had such a view. We thus need a different account of what grounds the assignment of planets to their zodiacal dwellings, and I contend that such an account can be found in the concept of dwelling itself. In his essay, Building, Dwelling, Thinking, the philosopher Martin Heidegger observes that we ordinarily assume that building is directed toward dwelling. I, for example, might build a house to dwell in it. On this conception, building and dwelling are two different activities, the former being pursued for the sake of the latter. But Heidegger argues that this common-sense perspective overlooks the more essential relation between them, since to build is already to dwell. According to Heidegger, dwelling is primary, and building is a mode of dwelling. He offers an etymological argument for the ontological primacy of dwelling. He begins by considering the verb bowen. Quote, what then does bowen, building, mean? The Old English and High German word for building, baun, means to dwell. This signifies to remain, to stay in place. End quote. He sees traces of this in the word nachbar, neighbor, meaning near dweller, and in buri, buren, buron, and boiron, which all signify dwelling, the abode, the place of dwelling. Heidegger then notes that there is an even deeper connection between dwelling and being. Quote, Bowen, baun, bu, bio, are our word bin in the versions ich bin, I am, du bist, you are, the imperative form bis, be. What then does ich bin mean? The old word bauen, to which the bin belongs, answers, Ich bin, du bist, mean, I dwell, you dwell. The way in which you are and I am, the manner in which we humans are on earth, is bound, dwelling. To be a human being means to be on the earth as a mortal. It means to dwell. End quote. At this fundamental level, dwelling is being. It is the way we are on earth, and the environment wherein building, in its more specific forms, can occur. This primary form of dwelling is so familiar that it is from the outset habitual, gewunta. And as we dwell and build, we thereby care for what is before us. For Bowen also means, quote, to cherish and protect, to preserve and care for, specifically to till the soil, to cultivate the vine. Such building only takes care. It tends the growth that ripens into its fruit of its own accord." End quote. Additionally, in dwelling we fashion man-made artifacts such as bridges and houses. In both caring and fashioning, dwelling consists in preserving the essences of things. Heidegger observes, quote, But let us listen once more to what language says to us. The Old Saxon vuon, the Gothic vunian, like the old word bowen, means to remain, to stay in place. But the Gothic vunian means more distinctly how this remaining is experienced. Vunian means to be at peace, to be brought to peace, to remain in peace. The word for peace, Frieda, means the free, das Freie, and Frei means preserved from harm and danger, preserved from something, safeguarded. To free really means to spare, 
The sparing itself consists not only in the fact that we do not harm the one whom we spare. Real sparing is something positive, and takes place when we leave something beforehand in its own nature, when we return it specifically to its essence, when we free it in the real sense of the word into a preserve of peace. To dwell, to be set at peace, means to remain at peace within the free, the preserve, the free sphere that safeguards each thing in its nature. The fundamental character of dwelling is this sparing and preserving. It pervades dwelling in its whole range." End quote. Dwelling, then, is a letting be of the essences of things. When we dwell with things, we preserve their essences, allowing them to reveal themselves as they are. We do not obscure them by attempting to twist them to our purposes. And, as Heidegger has argued elsewhere, these essences are constituted by what he calls the fourfold, the crossing of earth, sky, mortals, and divinities. Heidegger thus claims that dwelling preserves the essences of things by preserving the fourfold that gives them their essence. Heidegger uses the example of a bridge to show how dwelling, as fashioning, preserves the essences of things. According to Heidegger, the bridge gathers to itself, in its own way, earth, sky, divinities, and mortals. It lets earth stand as earth by bridging the two sides of the stream. It brings the banks together as banks of a river, and unites them with the surrounding landscape. The bridge gathers the earth as landscape around the stream. And, in opening itself to the sky, it allows the quality of light and weather to shine forth as it is. Quote, the waters may wander on quiet and gay. The sky's floods from storm or thaw may shoot past the piers in torrential waves. The bridge is ready for the sky's weather and its fickle nature. End quote. Likewise, the bridge provides the path on which mortals make their way. Quote, Always and ever differently, the bridge escorts the lingering and hastening ways of men to and fro, so that they may get to the other banks, and in the end, as mortals, to the other side. End quote. And, finally, the bridge allows the divinities to descend. Quote, now in a high arch, now in a low, the bridge vaults over glen and stream. Whether mortals keep in mind this vaulting of the bridge's course or forget that they, always themselves on their way to the last bridge, are actually striving to surmount all that is common and unsound in them in order to bring themselves before the haleness of the divinities. The bridge gathers, as a passage that crosses, before the divinities. Whether we explicitly think of and visibly give thanks for their presence, as in the figure of the saint of the bridge, or whether that divine presence is obstructed or even pushed wholly aside." End quote. In the bridge, then, the essences of things are gathered and allowed to stand forth as they are in the fourfold. Hence, Heidegger concludes that building thus characterized is a distinctive letting dwell. Furthermore, Heidegger follows the philosopher and poet Hölderlin in contending that the primordial nature of dwelling is poetic. For it is poetry and language that gather the essences of things and lets them shine forth in its clearing. Heidegger contends, quote, Poetry as the authentic gauging of the dimension of dwelling, is the primal form of building. Poetry, first of all, admits man's dwelling into its very nature. Poetry is the original admission of dwelling." End quote. Poetry, by fashioning an image in which God is made present in his absence, spans the distance between the unconditioned and the conditioned. Heidegger observes, quote, the poet makes poetry only when he takes the measure, 
by saying the sights of heaven in such a way that he submits to its appearances as to the alien element to which the unknown god has yielded. Our current name for the sight and appearance of something is image. The nature of the image is to let something be seen. By contrast, copies and imitations are already mere variations on the genuine image, which, as a sight or spectacle, lets the invisible be seen and so imagines the invisible in something alien to it. Because poetry takes that mysterious measure, to wit, in the face of the sky, therefore it speaks in images. This is why poetic images are imaginings in a distinctive sense. Not mere fancies and illusions, but imaginings that are visible inclusions of the alien in the sight of the familiar. The poetic saying of images gathers the brightness of sound and of the heavenly appearances into one with the darkness and silence of what is alien. By such sights, the God surprises us." End quote. Here, Heidegger contends that it is through images that things yield themselves to appearing. To begin with a mundane example, when I look at an apple, I see something red and round. I see what Heidegger would call the image in these sensible properties. But phenomenologically considered, I see not only the sensible properties of redness and roundness, but the apple appearing through them. For example, I know that if I were to walk around the apple, I would see its other side. And this other side of the apple, though visually absent, is nonetheless presented through the sensible impressions that I do see. A part of the apple, its backside, appears in its absence through the image that is present to me. God would constitute an extreme instance of this phenomenon, since God, unlike an apple, has no sensible properties whatsoever. Hence, when the unconditioned God appears in the conditioned world of experience, he remains one with the darkness and silence of what is alien. God's appearance is thus always a surprise. The poet must thus look to the sky to try to measure the span between God and man. Heidegger observes, quote, Hence, the measure is of the same nature as the sky. But the sky is not sheer light. The radiance of its height is itself the darkness of its all-sheltering breath. The blue of the sky's lovely blueness is the color of depth. The radiance of the sky is the dawn and dusk of the twilight, which shelters everything that can be proclaimed. The sky is the measure." End quote. Here Heidegger claims that the sky is a fitting image for the distance between God and humanity, since the sky contains both light and darkness. Light in that God presents himself through it, and darkness in that he nonetheless remains concealed. And the blue of the sky not only conveys translucence and calm, but also signifies depth and the anxiety it produces. Indeed, blueness permeates Hölderlin's poem that frames Heidegger's discussion, since it opens, quote, In lovely blue the steeple blossoms with its metal roof, around which Drift swallow cries, around which lies most loving blue. The sun, high overhead, tints the roof tin. But up in the wind, silent, the weathercock crows. End quote. The blue depths thus encompass the poet's work. And, as a result, Heidegger concludes that poesis is not merely a matter of personal self-expression. Quote, the poet does not work over the experiences of his soul, but rather stands under God's thunderstorm, with a bare head, defenseless, abandoned, and relinquished of his own accord. End quote. The poet's task is to look to the skies, hearken to its announcements, and attempt, to the best of his ability, to give names wherein God is pleased to dwell. 
I contend that the Heideggerian account of dwellings sketched above can explain why particular signs are given to particular planets as their houses in the Thema Mundi. The applicability of Heidegger's account to astrology should not surprise us, since Hölderlin, Heidegger's primary source, himself had astrological concerns in mind. Hölderlin is said to have formulated his account of dwelling by considering how Germans and Greeks differed in their architectonics of the skies. And again, Heidegger, following Hölderlin, maintains that poetry occurs by grace alone. Quote, as long as this arrival of grace endures, so long does man succeed in measuring himself not unhappily against the Godhead. When this measuring appropriately comes to light, man creates poetry from the very nature of the poetic." End quote. We thus once more have a correspondence between the poetic and astrological projects. Since charis, grace, a key poetic concept, and Cairo, to rejoice, a key astrological concept, share a common root. At their most basic level, signs are called houses because planets dwell in them. Signs constitute a clearing in which gender, quadruplicity, and triplicity are gathered to reveal themselves in their essential natures. Furthermore, in holding a space for these essences, signs constitute a fit abode for gods and goddesses. This view is suggested by Manilius when he assigns various tutelary deities to signs. He observes, quote, Mark well the tutelary deities appointed to the signs, and the signs which nature assigned to each god, when she gave to the great virtues the persons of the gods, and under sacred names established various powers, in order that a living presence might lend majesty to abstract qualities. End quote. Manilius here claims that tutelary deities are assigned to particular signs so that numinous powers might personally dwell in them. And in assigning these tutelary deities to signs, he does not always identify these deities with their corresponding planets in the Thema Mundi. Rather, he assigns them as follows. Quote, Pallas is protectress of the ram, the Cytherean of the bull, and Phoebus of the comely twins. You, Mercury, rule the crab, and you, Jupiter, as well as the mother of the gods, the lion. The virgin with her sheaf belongs to Ceres, and the balance to Vulcan, who wrought it. Bellicose scorpion clings to Mars. Diana cherishes the hunter, a man to be sure, but a horse in his other half and Vesta, the cramped stars of Capricorn. Opposite Jupiter, a Juno has the sign of Aquarius, and Neptune acknowledges the fishes as his own for all that they are in heaven." End quote. On Manilius' account, Venus and Mars are, as expected, assigned to Taurus and Scorpio as they are in the traditional domicile rulership scheme. But the other deities are given unexpected assignments. Pallas Athena, not Mars, is said to dwell in Aries. Apollo, not Mercury, in Gemini. Mercury, not the Moon, in Cancer. Jupiter and Sibyl, not the Sun, in Leo. Ceres, not Mercury, in Virgo. Vulcan, not Venus, in Libra. Diana, not Jupiter, in Sagittarius. Vesta, not Saturn, in Capricorn. Juno, not Saturn, in Aquarius, and Neptune, not Jupiter, in Pisces. I believe that writing off this account as an imaginative idiosyncrasy on Manilius's part would be a mistake. Rather, we should read this passage in light of his earlier claim that numinal powers are made personal through dwelling in signs. So, if we take a more abstract account of planetary meanings, planets, by dwelling in signs, would assume a more personal presence. And, as a result, though modern archetypal analysis fails to capture the overall metaphysics of traditional astrology, it may play a useful role within the more limited domain of planetary dwelling in signs. 
Zodiacal signs, then, are dwellings that create space for particular constellations of gender, quadruplicity, and triplicity, allowing each to manifest its particular nature. Let's examine each of these in turn. Gender is one crucial way that the essences of things are gathered in a sign. Signs are thus considered either masculine or feminine. Indeed, Ptolemy even goes so far as to say that this distinction is fundamental to the nature of things, claiming there are two primary kinds of natures, male and female. A sign, then, will gather what resides within it to let the masculine appear as masculine and the feminine as feminine. There were various systems of assigning gender to sign, but one popular Pythagorean strategy superimposed it on the distinction between odd and even numbers, the former being considered masculine and the latter feminine. But this leads to a problem, since the signs being odd or even would then depend upon where one begins counting. For example, if we follow the Thema Mundi and begin counting from the Ascendant, Cancer would be the first sign, and thus odd and masculine, and Leo would be even and feminine. Yet this conflicts with the traditional correlation of sign and gender, since, on the standard view, Cancer is considered even and feminine, and Leo odd and masculine. Macrobius attempts to provide a justification for numbering the signs in the traditional manner by claiming that we should begin counting at the midheaven a location occupied by Ares in the Thema Mundi. Macrobius argues, quote, Divulge the following reason for wishing Ares to be called the first, although there is nothing first or last in a sphere. According to them, at the beginning of that day which was the first of all days, that is, the time when the sky and the universe took their brilliant sheen, the day which is rightly called the birthday of the universe, Ares was in the middle of the sky, and because the middle of the sky is the summit of the universe, Ares was considered the first of the signs, since at the first dawn it appeared to be the head of the world." End quote. Here, Macrobius argues that Ares should be considered the first sign because it occupies the midheaven in the Thema Mundi, and counting should begin with the head, with what is on high. Presumably, the idea here is that our counting should follow a natural sequence in which the head is given priority. For example, since the head gives directions to the rest of the body, there is a sense in which it has priority over them. And similarly, since the midheaven is the high point of the zodiac, there is a sense in which it represents the realm of the gods, and so has priority over what is below it. As a result, Aries, Gemini, Leo, Libra, Sagittarius, and Aquarius are all considered to be odd-numbered and thus masculine signs. And Taurus, Cancer, Virgo, Scorpio, Capricorn, and Pisces are said to be even-numbered and thus feminine signs. Masculinity in the ancient world was associated with activity, or as Ptolemy calls it, active force and femininity with passivity or rest. Ptolemy also connects masculinity to drying and femininity to moistening. Presumably, when things are dry, they break apart and stand out in their own determinate shapes, and thus would be associated with active force. And when things are wet, they stick together and are rendered amorphous, and thus would be associated with passivity and rest. In addition to gender, signs also gather seasonal qualities. Hellenistic astrologers classified these qualities into three groups of four. Tropical, consisting of Cancer, Capricorn, Aries, and Libra. Solid, consisting of Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. And double-bodied, consisting of Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, and Pisces. Though each sign is analogous to the seasons that take place in them, they nonetheless share certain ways of relating to those seasons. Tropical signs inaugurate the seasons. Manilius explains, quote, They are called tropic signs, since in them turn the four seasons of the year, and untie the bonds which fasten them together. 
They bring change to the whole sky as it revolves on its axis, giving a new look to the works of man and the face of nature." End quote. These signs thus correspond to the beginnings of seasons, dissolving old connections and forging new ones to constitute a novel horizon for nature and culture to reveal themselves. Cancer contains the summer solstice, and thus corresponds to the beginning of summer. It, quote, prolongs the day to its greatest length, and then shortens it in retreating by small degrees, increasing night by the amount which it stole from day, end quote. Conversely, Capricorn contains the winter solstice, and corresponds to the beginning of winter. Capricorn forces sluggish winter through the shortest day and longest duration of night, and begins to lengthen daylight and dispel darkness. By turns, it now controls the day's losses, and now repairs them. Similarly, Aries inaugurates the spring, and Libra the fall, because of their corresponding equinoxes. They are signs which level the hours of light and darkness. In Aries, light and dark are held in balance as light begins to predominate. Then first the sea is calmed with tranquil wave, and the earth dares to send forth flowers in all their variety. Then amid happy pastures the tribes of bird and beast hasten to mate and breed, and the whole woodland speaks with melodious voice and grows green to full foliage. So deeply is nature stirred by the potency of the sign. Conversely, Libra balances the day and night as darkness begins to dominate. This is the season when the wine god comes down in full strength from laden elm, and the rich must pours foaming from pressed bunches of grapes. And this the season when men commit the corn to the furrows, whilst the soil, relaxed by autumn's warmth, opens to clasp the seed. In this manner, the tropical signs mark the changing seasons, suffering nothing to persist in its initial state. In contrast, solid signs gather the seasons in their purity and intensity. Taurus cares for the unadulterated spring, Leo the summer, Scorpio the fall, and Aquarius the winter. Following the beginnings of seasons in the tropical signs, solid signs reveal the abiding character of each of the seasons. Ptolemy, for example, notes that we are made more aware of seasons and their purity in these signs, since we have, by then, accustomed ourselves to their weather, and so can experience the seasons with focus and clarity. He speculates that signs are solid because when the sun is in them, the moisture, heat, dryness, and cold of the seasons that begin in the preceding signs touch us more firmly. Not that the weather is naturally any more intemperate at that time, but that we are by then inured to them, and for that reason are more sensible of their power. And finally, double-bodied signs, standing between the solid signs of one season and the tropical signs of another, concern the space between seasons. Just as the figures associated with them have two bodies, so too do these signs hold together the characteristics of two seasons. Again, Ptolemy explains that these signs are called double-bodied because they are between the solid and the tropical signs, and share, as it were, at end and beginning, the natural properties of two states of weather. Gemini partakes of both spring and summer. Virgo, summer and fall, Sagittarius, fall and winter, and Pisces, winter and spring. Signs are also grouped into four sets of three, corresponding to the classical elements of fire, air, water, and earth. These roots or elements were thought to be the fundamental constituents of things. The Pythagorean philosopher Empedocles was the first to articulate this concept when he announced, quote, Here, first of all, the four roots of all things. Zeus the gleaming, Hera who gives life, Idonius, and Nestus who moistens with her tears the mortal fountain. End quote. 
Later philosophers took Empedocles to here identify Zeus with fire, Hera with air, Nestus with water, and Idoneus with earth. These basic elements form different things when either combined by love or separated by strife. Plato, in the Timaeus, goes on to identify these elements with geometrical shapes, the so-called platonic solids, to account for their physical properties. He identifies fire with the tetrahedron, air with the octahedron, water with the isosahedron, and earth with the hexahedron. And Aristotelians assign each element a natural place and motion, as Aristotle suggests in the following passage from the Physics, quote, Further, the typical locomotions of the elementary natural bodies, namely fire, earth, and the like, show not only that place is something, but also that it exerts a certain influence. Each is carried to its own place, if it is not hindered, the one up, the other down. Now these are regions or kinds of place, up and down, and the rest of the six directions. Nor do such distinctions, up and down, and right and left, etc., hold only in relation to us. To us, they are not always the same, but change with the direction in which we are turned. That is why the same thing may be both right and left, up and down, before and behind. But in nature, each is distinct, taken apart by itself. It is not every chance direction which is up, but where fire and what is light are carried. Similarly, too, down is not any chance direction, but where what has weight and what is made of earth are carried. The implication being that these places do not differ merely in relative position, but also as possessing distinct potencies. End quote. On this view, fire thus naturally tends upward to its natural place. Air, too, moves upward, but not as forcefully as fire. Earth, in contrast, moves downward, towards its natural place, and so does water, but, like air, with less force. When correlating zodiacal signs with elements, Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius are assigned to fire, Aquarius, Gemini, and Libra to air, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces to water, and Capricorn, Taurus, and Virgo to Earth. By clearing a space for a particular gender, quadruplicity, and triplicity to reveal itself, a sign constitutes a dwelling in which planetary powers can manifest themselves concretely as personal gods and goddesses. In the next section, I will illustrate this claim by considering the case of Mars, as it reveals itself as Ares and Athena in Aries and Scorpio, respectively. At its most general level, Mars represents the realm of becoming as it exists in itself. Mars is nature in itself, red in tooth and claw. Valens thus associates it with force, wars, plunderings, screams, and violence. And Porphyry similarly claims, quote, The star of Mars is fiery and bloody like a branding iron. Therefore it speaks of the hot blood in us and of the spermatic impulse and of feminine fetuses, of action and of both dangers and courage and anger and daring and violence and perilous affairs, and of severe suffering, of military service, and both of war and the employment of iron, and wounds, and all those things that happen with quickness and panic, and it is called paroes." End quote. I contend that this general planetary power becomes personalized as a particular deity by dwelling in the zodiacal signs it rules, namely Aries and Scorpio. According to Manilius, the god and goddess assigned to Mars's domiciles are Ares and Athena. This is a fitting assignment, since Ares and Athena are the primary war deities of ancient Greece. For example, in the Iliad, when Aphrodite complains to Zeus that she has been wounded in battle, he tells her to stay off the battlefield and leave the fighting to Ares and Athena. Quote, 
So she spoke, and the father of gods and men smiled on her and spoke to Aphrodite the Golden, calling her to him. No, my child, not for you are the works of warfare. Rather, concern yourself only with the lovely secrets of marriage, while all this warfare shall be left to Athene and sudden Ares. End quote. Or again, when Ares is massacring the Greeks without restraint, Zeus sends Athena to check him. Then, in turn, the father of gods and men made answer, Go to it then, and set against him the spoiler, Athene, who, beyond all others, is the one to visit harsh pains upon him. End quote. These passages reveal Ares and Athena as two primary war gods of the Greek pantheon, thus explaining why Manilius would assign them to the houses of Mars. Manilius entrusts Ares to Athena as her house, and Scorpio to Ares. Yet I contend that it is better to reverse this assignment and give Ares to Ares and Athena to Scorpio. For this better comports with the genders of the signs, the god Ares dwelling in the masculine sign of Ares, and the goddess Athena in the feminine sign of Scorpio. Furthermore, I argue that when we look to the particular characteristics of these signs, a clear consonance emerges between deity and sign when we assign them in this way. Manilius's argument for his assignment appears to rest on a few poetic associations between the images of the signs and the exploits of the deities in question. For example, Manilius argues that the ram's wool is vital for commerce, since woolworking was so important that Athena, quote, herself has claimed it for her own hands, of which she has judged it worthy, and deems her victory over Arachne a token of her greatness." End quote. Here Manilius refers to the story of Athena and Arachne, in which Arachne boasts of her ability to weave wool, challenging the gods in her pride. She competes with Athena and wins, but Athena grows so angry that she rips up Arachne's work, strikes her on the head, and turns her into a spider. Yet there is only a tenuous connection to wool in the story, and Athena does not stand out as a particular goddess. Any vengeful deity could have served just as well to punish human hubris. Manilius's argument for associating Ares with Scorpio is similarly tenuous. He claims that, quote, by virtue of his tail armed with its powerful sting, the scorpion creates natures ardent for war and active service, end quote. But, as demonstrated earlier, warfare is also associated with Athena in Greek thought. So, the symbolic association between the scorpion stinger and martial activities is not sufficient to ground an exclusive association with Ares. Furthermore, Manilius' association of the sign with those who devote their leisure to the study of war and every pursuit which arises from the art of war better fits with Athena the strategist than raging Ares. In contrast, if we entrust Ares to Ares and Athena to Scorpio, we get a clear contrast between two modes of being in war. Two modes of being that are poetically expressed in the Iliad and the Odyssey, respectively. Homer's Iliad recounts the story of Achilles' rage and its consequences. The story takes place near the end of the Trojan War, when Achilles, the greatest of the Greek warriors, is dishonored by Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek forces. As a result, Achilles withdraws from the battle and allows the Greeks to be massacred by the Trojans. Eventually, he allows his friend Patroclus to go out in his armor to defend the Greeks, but Patroclus is killed in battle by Hector, one of the greatest Trojan warriors. Achilles then directs his rage to the Trojans, goes into battle, kills Hector, and desecrates his corpse. His wrath only relents near the end of the poem, when the gods give him a direct command to release Hector's body, and Priam, king of the Trojans, sneaks into the Greek camp to plead for the corpse of his son. Achilles relents when he thinks of his own father, who will mourn like Priam at his own impending death. The story ends with Hector's funeral as his people mourn for him and for all the dead. The god Ares is intimately connected with this poem. We can see the connection at the very outset of the epic, when Homer invokes the muse, calling on her to sing Achilles' divine rage. 
Homer prays, quote, Sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus's son Achilles, and its devastation, which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans, hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades, strong souls of heroes, but gave their bodies to be the delicate feasting of dogs, of all birds. And the will of Zeus was accomplished, since that time when first there stood in division of conflict Atreus' son, the lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. End quote. The muse thus sings of divine wrath and its devastation, a topic fitting for the war god Ares. It is a song of heroes and their deaths in battle, and the devastation that unfolds is brought about not by superior strategy, but falls upon the Greeks as they turn against each other in rage. Indeed, Ares is even presented as presiding over the Trojan War itself, and thus over the events of the Iliad. In this scene, Helen is described as, quote, weaving a great web, a red folding robe, and working into it the numerous struggles of Trojans, breakers of horses, and bronze-armored Achaeans, struggles that they endured for her sake at the hands of Ares. Indeed, Ares even appears personally in the poem, descending to rouse the troops to battle, and sometimes actively engaging in combat himself. Similarly, Ares is said to enter Hector as he prepares for battle. Quote, the armor was fitted to Hector's skin, and Ares, the dangerous war god, entered him, so that the inward body was packed full of force and fighting strength. He went onward, calling in a great voice to his renowned companions in arms, and figured before them flaming in the battle gear of great-hearted Pelion. End quote. And when Achilles returns to the fight, he is described as looking like Ares. Quote, but the Trojans were taken every man in the knees with trembling and terror, as they looked on the swift-footed son of Peleus shining in all his armor a man like murderous Ares. But after the Olympians merged in the men's company, strong hatred, defender of peoples, burst out, and Athene bellowed, standing now beside the ditch dug at the walls outside, and now again at the thundering sea's edge gave out her great cry, while on the other side Ares in the likeness of a dark storm cloud bellowed, now from the peaks of the citadel urging the Trojans sharply on, now running beside the sweet banks of Simois. End quote. In this passage, Achilles is not only portrayed as resembling the war god, but Ares himself, along with Athena, gives a war cry as the two sides face each other in combat. There is thus a special consonance between Ares and the Iliad. And when we examine the further details of the story, we will see that this poetic residence of the god has features corresponding to Ares, the masculine tropical fire sign. Let's examine each of these features in turn. Perhaps most obviously, the masculine aspect of the story can be seen in the fact that Ares, the god of war, is portrayed as a male deity. But, more importantly, we can see masculinity in the quality of the actions the Iliad recounts. Ancient authors associated masculinity with activity, and the Iliad recounts plenty of activity. Great armies face each other in war, and many battles are fought throughout the poem. Likewise, the conflict between Agamemnon and Achilles has a masculine character, since they quarrel over honor, and, more specifically, over war brides. Agamemnon being forced to return his war bride Chryses to her father, a priest of Apollo, takes Achilles' war bride Bryses so as not to lose honor. But this dishonors Achilles, inciting his rage and causing him to withdraw from the war. The drama of the Iliad thus has a martial, masculine flavor to it. As a tropical sign, Ares initiates. This can be seen in the actions of the Iliad. The Iliad is, as noted earlier, a song of wrath. Achilles' rage is something that erupts on the scene, turning the course of the Trojan War. The Iliad is thus a fundamentally tropical poem, since it focuses on a novel event and its consequences. 
The Iliad's tropical character is also manifested in the subsequent events of its plot. Multiple characters take decisive action, go out into battle, and turn the course of events. For example, Apollo smites the Greeks with a plague, and then heals them when his priest intercedes. Or again, Diomedes, Hector, Agamemnon, Patroclus, and Achilles are all given Aristea scenes, in which they go forth and rout their enemies on the battlefield. Fire embodies wrath and the fury of war. It is also associated with cutting and separation in the classical world. For example, Plato's Timaeus identifies fire with a tetrahedron, since it, of all the elements, has the power to move and to cut. For the tiniest body belongs to fire, and the body that has the fewest faces is of necessity the most mobile, in that it, more than any other, has the edges that are the sharpest and best fit for cutting in every direction. The Iliad is fiery in this additional sense, since it too is a story of cutting. Large numbers of soldiers are literally cut down, and the Iliad cuts a metaphorical division between the undying gods, who appear almost comic when injured in battle, and mortals who meet their end in the battlefield. And it likewise divides Greek from Trojan, and Achilles and his warriors from the rest of the Greek forces. Moreover, the image of fire itself occurs at several key junctures in the Iliad. For example, Achilles finally begins to relent and allows Patroclus to go out and fight in his armor when the Greek forces suffer defeat and the Trojans begin to burn their ships. And the poem concludes with an image of fire in Hector's funeral pyre. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, the people gathered around the pyre of illustrious Hector. But when all were gathered to one place and assembled together, first with gleaming wine they put out the pyre that was burning, all where the fury of the fire still was in force, and thereafter the brothers and companions of Hector gathered the white bones up, mourning, as the tears swelled and ran down their cheeks. Then they laid what they had gathered up in a golden casket and wrapped this about with soft robes of purple, and presently put it away in the hollow of the grave, and over it piled huge stones laid close together. Lightly and quickly they piled up the grave barrow, and on all sides were set watchmen for fear the strong grieved Achaeans might too soon set upon them. They piled up the grave barrow and went away, and thereafter assembled in a fair gathering and held a glorious feast within the house of Priam, king under God's hand. Such was the burial of Hector, breaker of horses." End quote. Just as Ares presides over the Iliad, so too does Athena over the Odyssey. The Odyssey tells the story of Odysseus's return home after the Trojan War, and the difficulties he faces along the way. In his absence, brazen suitors usurp his house and plunder it, seeking to marry his wife Penelope and to kill his son Telemachus. Odysseus, disguised by Athena, eventually returns to Ithaca and slaughters the suitors by means of a carefully laid trap. Athena is, by far, the most active divinity in the story personally intervening at almost every key juncture. She advocates for Odysseus among the Olympians at the outset of the poem. She appears in disguise to Telemachus, calling him to leave the island and seek news of his lost father. She disguises Odysseus as an old tramp when he returns to Ithaca so that the suitors will not recognize him. She inspires Penelope to devise the trial of the bow to gather the suitors in one place to be slaughtered. She fights alongside Odysseus against the suitors. And after the suitors are dead and their families seek vengeance, Athena once more intervenes in Olympus to secure peace for the land, and then personally fights beside Odysseus, Laertes, and Telemachus, and against the kinsmen of the suitors. And finally, Athena commands Odysseus to relent from fighting and show mercy so peace can be restored. Thus. From first to last, Athena has a hand in the events of the Odyssey. 
Furthermore, Athena remarks that she is fond of Odysseus because they are akin to each other. At this point in the story, Odysseus has landed in Ithaca, and Athena, disguised as a shepherd boy, comes to meet him. Odysseus greets her with a clever lie, quote, And so he answered her again and addressed her in winged words. But he did not tell her the truth, but checked that word from the outset, forever using to every advantage the mind that was in him." End quote. Athena responds to his deceit by praising him for his craftiness and declaring that she loves him because they are alike. Quote, the goddess, gray-eyed Athene, smiled on him and stroked him with her hand and took the shape of a woman both beautiful and tall, and well-versed in glorious handiworks, and spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, saying, It would be a sharp one, and a stealthy one, who would ever get past you in any contriving, even if it were a god against you. He wretch, so devious, never weary of tricks, then you would not even in your own country give over your ways of deceiving and your thievish tales. They are near to you in your very nature. But come, let's talk no more of this, for you and I both know sharp practice, since you are far the best of all mortal men for counsel and for stories, and I, among all the divinities, am famous for wit and sharpness. And yet you never recognized Pallas Athene, daughter of Zeus, the one who is always standing beside you and guarding you in every endeavor." End quote. And she makes a similar claim when she remarks that, quote, "...always you are the same, and such is the mind within you. And so I cannot abandon you when you are unhappy, because you are fluent and reason closely, and keep your head always." Anyone else come home from wandering would have run happily to see his children and wife in his halls. But it is not your pleasure to investigate and ask questions, not till you have made trial of your wife." End quote. Athena here claims that she cannot abandon Odysseus because he, like she, thinks things through strategically. Rather than simply running home to greet his wife and son, he wants to survey the situation and test even his wife to make sure it is safe to reveal himself. Hence, Athena, more than any other deity, plays an essential role in the events of the Odyssey. With this background in mind, we can see how the poetic dwelling of Athena in the Odyssey corresponds to the sign of Scorpio, as it holds together femininity, solidity, and the element of water. Let's examine each of these features in turn. Athena and Penelope play a central role in the story of the Odyssey, providing an obvious example of its feminine character. Furthermore, the events of the Odyssey are more passive than those of the Iliad, and so, to the classical mind, are to that extent more feminine. Rather than telling a tale of rage and of exploits on the battlefield, the Odyssey recounts the story of a homecoming. Battles are fought, but they are fought to secure the return of Odysseus and the restoration of his family and community. Indeed, this passivity is even displayed in the poem's first depiction of Odysseus as he, yearning for home, weeps on Calypso's island. Odysseus is a passive captive on this island, freed only because of Athena's intercession and Zeus's consequent command, conveyed through Hermes, that he should be allowed to return home. Odysseus, in this scene, sits on the seashore, quote, His eyes were never wiped dry of tears, and the sweet lifetime was draining out of him, as he wept for a way home, since the nymph was no longer pleasing to him. By nights he would lie beside her, of necessity, in the hollow caverns, against his will, by one who was willing. But all the days he would sit upon the rocks, and at the seaside breaking his heart in tears and lamentation and sorrow, as weeping tears he looked out over the barren water." End quote. This description of Odysseus's predicament could just as easily apply to Chryses and Bryses, the war brides in the Iliad. 
Moreover, femininity is also displayed in Odysseus's concern for the purification of the home after the slaughter of the suitors, and in the secret signs by which he and Penelope recognize each other. Unlike the tropical Ares, which initiates action, Scorpio, a solid sign, concerns sustained states of depth and purity. Given that it is a house of Mars, Scorpio concerns warfare. Yet it does not preside over the flaring up of war as Ares does, but over war as an abiding state. This is illustrated by the strategic warfare of Athena and Odysseus. Rather than jumping headlong into battle like the warriors of the Iliad, Odysseus, searching for the ideal time and place to strike, adopts various disguises and fashions elaborate plans to defeat his enemies. War, in a fixed sign, is like a spider's web. The spider need only wait for its prey to walk into the trap. Such strategic warfare requires a keen intellect. For example, the famous military strategist Clausewitz observes that, if the mind is to emerge unscathed from the relentless struggle with the unforeseen in war, it must, even in the darkest hour, retain some glimmerings of the inner light which leads to truth. He calls this kind of intellectual insight kudoi, and claims that it refers not alone to the physical, but more commonly to the inward eye, to the quick recognition of a truth that the mind would ordinarily miss, or would perceive only after long study and reflection. Odysseus displays such genius when he surprises the suitors in the trial of the bow. Rather than directly assaulting them when he arrives home, as one can imagine Achilles or Agamemnon doing, Odysseus bides his time, and strikes only after he has an advantage, employing what Clausewitz calls the principle of the concentration of forces. According to Clausewitz, quote, The best strategy is always to be very strong, first in general, and then at the decisive point. Apart from the effort needed to create military strength, which does not always emanate from the general, there is no higher and simpler law of strategy than that of keeping one's forces concentrated. No force should ever be detached from the main body unless the need is definite and urgent." End quote. Odysseus employs this strategy when slaughtering the suitors, since he gathers his few allies in one place to fall upon his captive enemies. And he makes sure that his men are armed while his opponents are not. This allows Odysseus to bring all his force to bear upon his adversaries. Water plays a prominent role in the Odyssey. The poem recounts a nostos, a journey home over water. Not only does Odysseus undergo many adventures at sea, but his son Telemachus must also sail forth to learn his father's whereabouts. Furthermore, we see a connection to water in the divine antagonist of the story, Poseidon, the sea god who bears a grudge against Odysseus for blinding his son Polyphemus. And the element of water is also present in the many secret tears Odysseus sheds throughout the poem. Indeed, the island of Ithaca itself is associated with water, when Athena describes it as a land marked by its rainfall. She observes, quote, See now, this is a rugged country, and not for the driving of horses. But neither is it so unpleasant, though not widely shapen. For there is abundant grain for bread grown here. It produces wine, and there is always rain and the dew to make it fertile. It is good to feed goats and cattle, and timber is there of all sorts, and watering places good through the seasons." End quote. And if we connect moisture and fertility in this manner, we can see a connection to water in the restoration of Odysseus's home and of Ithaca's social order. There is thus an interesting parallel between the Iliad and the Odyssey and the houses of Mars in Hellenistic astrology. As a result, they can serve as primary illustrations of how signs, in gathering gender, quadruplicity, and triplicity, erect houses for the gods and thereby allow planetary powers to dwell among us as divinities. The Heideggerian concept of dwelling thus furnishes an interesting account of the natural connection between planets and signs. 
On this view, the assignment of planets to their domiciles in the Thema Mundi is grounded in the fact that signs, by gathering a particular gender quadruplicity and triplicity, allow planets to manifest themselves as personal gods and goddesses. For the gods are the brightening ones, whose brightening offers the greeting sent by gaiety. Gaiety is the essential ground of the greeting, that is, of the angelic, in which the very being of the gods consists. It is for this reason that planets can be said to rejoice in particular signs, for in them these general powers dwell as ministering angels. This, again, is a concept captured poetically by Hölderlin. Angels of the house, come. May the power of heaven spread through all the veins of life, ennobling and invigorating and dispensing joy, so that joyful angels attend upon human goodness every hour of the day, and that such joy as I experienced now, when loved ones are properly reunited, be suitably sanctified. When we bless the meal, upon whom shall I call? And when we rest after the day's activity, tell me, how will I offer thanks? Should I call the highest by name? A god doesn't like what is inappropriate. Maybe our joy isn't big enough to grasp him. We must often remain silent. A sacred language is missing. Hearts are beating, and yet speech can't emerge. But the sound of string music resonates hour by hour, and perhaps that pleases the approaching gods. Begin the music, and the worries almost vanish which would have affected our joy. Willingly or not, poets must often concern themselves with such things, but not with others.